How's it going, everybody? And thank you for joining me on Out of the Both Rows for Weekly Word Wednesday. So we're going to go ahead and go through Corinthians here. And tonight I'm just going to read through the first and second chapter as we kind of get a more understanding and discuss uh, Paul's description of how we should live out the, a holy life and what we're supposed to be, do, or be doing when we're called to our Lord Jesus Christ. In that, we're also going to get an understanding of Paul's description of what it means to be the temple of the Holy Spirit and to be the temple of God and how we should conduct ourselves. He's speaking to the church in Corinth, and there's actually a situation going on where there's division amongst the church. There are certain people that are becoming boastful based off of the preacher that they're listening to and who they follow. Uh, instead of just realizing that all of us actually follow our Lord Jesus Christ and abide in Him and he, as He abides in our, uh, our Father in Heaven. So with that, Paul's trying to stifle that and get everybody to understand we're all working as a unit and we're all working as a team. Uh, no matter which person it is that we tend to listen to more, have discussions with more, what group we're affiliated with. As long as we're all Christians and we're all following our Lord Jesus Christ, we're all one team in that situation. It kind of brings up the situation of the division amongst all the other churches that actually are in existence now. It kind of seems like there's a church on every single corner. Uh, it's kind of brought up some thoughts of my own on why more churches don't actually group together and, and try and build a bigger a bigger thing and get something more movement going on within that. It seems like a lot of people want to start their own church instead of maybe associating with another church or all these denominations that believe that their interpretation of the Bible is more correct than another denomination and how there's a lot of people that subscribe to one teaching or one group more than another. So it seems like this teaching is actually still going on to this day. And so I just want to kind of share what it is that was going on in uh, Corinth in order for us to all kind of get an understanding and maybe think about what it is that we're doing and how we should truly conduct ourselves when we're living a holy life for our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to start in chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Sothenus, our brother, to the church of God that is in Corinth, to you who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be holy, with all those everywhere who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we can see here right in the beginning, Paul is saying that, He's speaking to everybody who's been sanctified, set apart, is going through the process of God and Jesus teaching us and working with us in order for us to be more representation of him. With all those everywhere who call upon the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. So he's saying everywhere, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, it doesn't matter what group they affiliate with or what it is that they call themselves, as long as they profess that they are with the Lord Jesus Christ, we're all supposed to be uh, working as one unit and working together for um, the betterment of the kingdom of God. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 4. I give thanks to my God always on your account for the grace of God bestowed on you in Christ Jesus, that in him you are enriched in every way with all discourse and all knowledge, as the testimony to Christ was confirmed among you, said you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you firm till the end, irreproachable on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, irreproachable kind of means without fault, without blemish, a uh, situation in where you haven't continuously backslid 
and live the same lifestyle you lived before you were called, that you actually show that you are set apart and living a new life. God is faithful, and by it also means uh, so that nobody can point the finger at you and try and downplay uh, the power of the kingdom of God. Verse 9, God is faithful, and by him you were called to fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Verse 10, I urge you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree in what you say, and that there be no division among you, but that you be united in the same mind and in the same purpose. For it has been reported to me about you, my brothers, by Chloe's people, that there are rivalries among you. I mean that each of you is saying, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I give thanks that I baptized none of you except for Chrysippus and Gaius, so that no one can say that they were baptized in my name. For Christ did not send me to be baptized, or to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with wisdom of human eloquence, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its meaning. Uh, what he's saying here is that, uh, what he means that the cross of Christ might not be emptied in its meaning. What I feel that he's trying to get across there is that everything we do points to what God did for us when he gave his only son on the cross and forgave us of our sins in that one action of paying the debt that we owed. If we were to put it on ourselves and say that somehow we're doing something for the salvation of another and then take that away from Christ, that we're not doing a service to the kingdom of God. And that if we were to speak in certain ways that made us fallacious um, or gave us some kind of grandiose feeling within ourselves, that we're actually doing a disservice to our own callings and to what we've chosen to live by Jesus calling us and us deciding to walk with him. Verse 18. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the learning of the learned I will set aside. Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made, this, made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through wisdom, it was the will of God through the foolishness of the proclamation of God, the proclamation to save those who have faith. For Jews demanded signs, and Greeks looked for wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called Jews and Greeks alike, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Verse 26. Consider your own calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were noble birth. Rather, God chose the foolish of the world to shame the wise, and God chose the weak of the world to shame the strong, and God chose the lowly and despised of the world, those who count for nothing, to reduce to nothing those who are something, so that no human being might boast before God. It is due to him that you are in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God, as well as righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that, as it is, so that as it is written, whoever boasts should boast in the Lord. So here it's saying that um, what God's actually doing is picking people that humbled themselves, are doing what other people would consider mundane work, aren't considered strong or intelligent, and those that 
lean on their own successes, their own ability to do things and kind of use that as a way to put themselves above others that the lowly people of the world are actually there to cause those people to question whether or not what their abilities are anything because they're all being given to us as gifts and we're supposed to use those for, for the purposes of God. <clears throat> and that if we do choose to boast, we should boast in the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ died for us and chose us and nothing else. So we're going to go ahead and start chapter 2. And we're going to finish chapter 2 before we get into 3. We'll do 3 next week. Um, but chapter 2 here. When I came to you, brothers, proclaiming the mysteries of God, I did not come with sublimity, uh, sublimity of words or of wisdom. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and much trembling. And my message and my proclamation were not with persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of spirit and power, so that your faith may not rest on human wisdom, but on the power of God. So what he's saying here is that when he came proclaiming Jesus Christ, that's the only thing that he was proclaiming, is that Jesus Christ is the way for us to actually reconcile ourselves to God and what he has done for us is one of the most beautiful gifts that we can ever be given. <clears throat> and so allowing the actual act of Jesus Christ and his own sacrifice for us to be what it is that actually people are wowed by and are intrigued with not the way he spoke not the things that he did but the way that he proclaimed the Lord Jesus Christ verse 6 yet we do not speak wisdom to those who are mature but not a wisdom of this age nor of the rule oh yet we do speak a wisdom to those who are mature but not a wisdom of this age nor of the rulers of this age who are passing away. Rather, we speak God's wisdom, mysterious, hidden, which God predetermined before the ages for our glory, and which none of the rulers of this age knew for. If they had known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, What eye has not seen, and ear has not heard, and what has not entered the human heart, what God has prepared for those who love him. This God has revealed to us through the Spirit. So the Spirit of God actually revealed to us the way that God loves us and the way that we love him. And that's what's allowing us, um, the calling that we had, actually to strive for God and not to seek after earthly wisdom and earthly riches and earthly strengths that we actually are striving for what it is that God wants from us because that's the true wisdom that's the true life and what he's done for us is put in our hearts a situation where we understand what it is that we have done in our own lives and how far we fell and how rebellious we were towards God and in a true act of love we're actually going to turn away from our own lives and the things that we wanted of this earth and chase after what it is that God wants because he loves us as well and his way is the best way for us and through the spirit that he's given us we come to understand that for the spirit scrutinizes everything even the depths of God among human beings who know what pertains to a person except among human beings who knows what pertains to a person except the spirit of the person that is within. Similarly, no one knows what pertains to God, except the spirit of God. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit that is from God, so that we may understand the things freely given us by God. And we speak about them not with words taught by human wisdom, but with words taught by the spirit, describing spiritual realities in spiritual terms. 
So he's saying here that the Spirit of God actually questions everything and comes to try to analyze and understand. And that a person knows his own ways and his own wills and why he chooses to do things. And since we've been given the Spirit of God and not a worldly spirit, we understand why it is that God's chosen and chooses to do things. Not in its full understanding, because we're all working towards that, but with the same sense that we understand that God is trying to do the best thing for us by giving up his son, allowing him to come back to him, allowing us to come back to him, uh, even after all the wretched things that we have done in his eyes, so that we can be close to him and no longer be separated in darkness uh, from both the, you know, the living water, the tree of life, uh, our Father, who without him we are completely uh, destitute and empty. <clears throat> so verse 14. Now the natural person does not accept what pertains to the Spirit of God, for to him it is foolishness, and he cannot understand it, because it's judging spiritually. The spiritual person, however, can judge everything, but is not subject to judgment by anyone. For who has known the mind of the Lord so as to counsel him? But we have the mind of Christ. So in this, we understand that we've been given the spirit and the mind of our Lord Jesus Christ. He sent the counselor to us. So the Holy Spirit's actually who counsels us. And we are to have discussion with each other and try to work things out and to argue or debate each other uh, to try and get more understanding and for both of us to be corrected because if we're so separated that we feel one of us should teach the other um, the both of us have something wrong going on there so we should be open to discussions with everybody and to be willing to talk with everyone but at the end of the day, it's the spirit who judges everything. And because we have that spirit, we are actually not subject to any judgment by anyone based on what it is that we do. So long as we're continuing to strive in our Lord Jesus Christ and to live by him and the sanctification that he's given us. So with that, people may say a lot of things about us uh, and they may say a lot of things personally about you, whether it's good or bad. Um, it's not for the judgments of people to tell us what it is the Spirit's actually doing. So with that, don't take that as like an arrogant standing above everybody else. But in the same sense, don't let other people bring you down uh, based on what they're thinking at this certain time. Because they may not have the Spirit of God with them, or they may be choosing to reject it. And in that sense, they may actually be in a place where they don't feel good about themselves, or... Maybe they've chosen to follow somebody and boast them up. In that situation, they're not judging correctly with that. And is if they're not coming from a place of love, um, then it's not really something that we should take to heart and allow to beat us down. We are to go ahead and analyze everything and keep watchful so that we don't slip up into other people's sins and other people's temptations. Uh, be very vigilant in our actions, but with that at the same time, um, don't take that as a place to, to shun other people or put them down just because of the fact that they may not have a full understanding. Because if they're trying to work it out and they're trying to understand and they're trying to change their thought processes, that's what we're all here for is to sit there with people and to discuss with them the ways of our Lord Jesus Christ so that they can make on their own decision whether or not they want to try to conform to that or they want to continue to live their own lives um, and reject the calling of Lord Jesus Christ. So I just want to finish by repeating that last section because we have been given the mind of Christ. And in a sense, this is why I believe that the Lord Jesus Christ asks us not to call ourselves teachers in any way um, because we're all brothers and brothers stand up for each other and they stick their neck out for each other and they show each other when they're slipping up without 
wanting to destroy them, but actually wanting them to uh, have betterment in their lives, to fulfill the wills of God, and to actually do what it is that is good for them. That's where a brotherly standpoint comes from. It's not about owning somebody or trying to drive them to your will. Uh, it's no longer about our will. It's about the Lord Jesus Christ and the will of the, our Heavenly Father. So in that, for who has known the mind of the Lord so as to counsel him? So we're not there to really be each other's counselor. We just show each other, hey, I see what's going on. Uh, I'm not sure that this is the right direction. Do you want to talk about this? What's going on with you? Uh, and sit down and just kind of get an understanding and, and tell each other what it is that is going on with your lives, why it is that you're feeling a certain way, uh, whether to show somebody that they're making error against the word um, or to just try and better understand because if you start to notice them maybe going through some depression uh, or you know, they're lashing out at people. That's usually because something's going on within themselves. And we should direct them towards our Lord Jesus Christ and have them seek him out because he's there to correct those things and to help us live the life he expects. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and close here in chapter 2. And next week, we'll go, go ahead and pick up in chapter 3. All right. Hope to be going, seeing you guys next week. Have a good one.